Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. church. Great to see you all here this morning for part two of our, I probably should put this on my ear, huh? My sound guy back there is thinking, why can't I hear him? Can you hear me better? Sorry, good morning. Hey, I, I, we're, we're part two of our, our keep the change, and if you're looking up there thinking, what is this idea of keep the change? If you missed last week, we want to encourage you to go online and check that out. But if you uh, were here last week, and maybe even still, you're thinking, what is Keep the Change all about? What is this idea? I want to I suggest a couple things. First of all, we, we talked last week that many of us don't like change. Is that right? Many of us don't enjoy change. In fact, a lot of you who have probably been around Arundel Christian Church for a while, you can look back over the past 18 months, maybe uh, two years, and you can see that a lot of things at ACC aren't quite the way they used to be. And for many of you, I, 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 I believe that our dislike for change, our dislike for seeing things done differently than they used to be done, would cause you to kind of put up this, this idea of, hey, Matt, you can just keep the change. I don't want it. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. We, we talked last week about there's, there's two ways really to influence uh, behavior, to influence change. There's one way is to manipulate it, which means I can, I, I can drag this church along with me, kicking and screaming, or we can spend some time in God's word and inspire it from what God has to say and who God is calling us to be. So what I want to do is in this second part of our Keep the Change series, I want to encourage you from God's word. I want to encourage you from scripture and look, who is God calling us to be? What is this, this church, Arundel Christian Church, how are we called to be different? What is it about us that God is calling to be uh, unique? And in all of that, I, I hope that your, your mind can change from instead of, hey, keep the change, to, you know, I want to embrace the change. I want to keep, in a way, Arundel Christian Church as a church that's willing to do whatever it takes for the cause of the gospel. I'm willing to keep the change as part of who we are as a church. If you remember, we, we kind of ended on this, this phrase last week that we need to be unified around a God-given vision. This is the why. We started with, ultimately, what's the purpose of this series? Why are we, doing, uh, why are we talking through this? Why are we spending time uh, even, even doing this series? We need to be unified as a church around a God-given vision. And we understand that unity right, points people to Jesus. When the church out, or when the people outside of the church see the church unified, it points people to Christ. And we understand that a vision is really important because it helps to bring focus and it helps to bring endurance and it brings about the right change within the church. But then we also talked about this idea of a God-given vision. We don't want to be, you know, focused on the wrong thing as a church. You remember we talked about Matthew Emmons last week. If you weren't here, Matthew Emmons was, uh, he was, he competed on behalf of the United States of America in the 2004 Olympics. He was a sharpshooter, a rifleman, and basically what, what, what happened was in 2004, he was a shoe-in for the gold medal. All he had to do was hit the target anywhere on the target, and he, he got his, his gun out, right, and he, he got himself kind of in that unity of, of mind and heartbeat and everything. He got himself calm and he looked through his scope and he saw a target on the other end and he pulled the trigger and he hit a bullseye 
on the wrong target. Dropping from first place to eighth place. The reason we're going through this series together as a church is I want to make sure that not only can we be unified for the sake of the gospel, not only can we have a vision for the sake of focus and for the sake of endurance and for the sake of God-ordained change, but I want to make sure that what's on the other end of the scope is the right bullseye, the place that God is calling us to specifically. And if we can find out what that is today and we can be unified around it, it is going to be amazing to watch what God can do. And I want to share some of those plans with you. So if we understand that we're looking for our bullseye this morning, I left you with kind of a cliffhanger last week. Today I'm going to kind of lay it out there. If last week we talked about the why, this week we're going to answer four questions. We're going to answer the what, the how, the who, and the when. I want to say uh, right off the bat, that the answers to these questions can be very controversial. There are churches all over the place that would answer these questions differently. Now, I would go as far as to say they would answer three of these four questions differently. The last one I don't think is super controversial, uh, but there are churches that find themselves approaching their answer to the other three questions uniquely, And we also feel called to have a specific answer to these questions. Not only do we want to be unified, but we want to be unified around our vision, and our vision is answered in these four questions. What is God calling us to? How is he calling us to do it? Who is he calling to do it? And when is he calling us to do it? Uh, Because of how controversial these things can be, I want to ask you to pray with me because I want to make sure that the words that come out of my mouth this morning wouldn't just be my words, um, but they would be God-inspired, God-given, God-directed. Let's pray together. Father, I ask right now that you would speak through me, that you would give me a clarity of mind and speech, that you would help my words to be in line with your will and your purpose for this church. God, that you would help us to see who you're calling us to be, what you're calling us to be, how you're calling us to get there. God, who you're calling to do the work and when you're calling us to do it. Make these things really clear for each of us this morning. Help us to embrace the change you have already shown us and still have in store for us. We love you. We thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's tackle uh, this first question. What? is the vision that God's calling us to be unified around. Uh, We understand why it's important to be unified, but we we now need to kind of look into God's word. What is it that God's calling us to be unified around? Let me say first and foremost, the Bible is super clear that everything we do, everything you and I do, we do for, uh, for one main purpose, and it's to glorify God. Every time you work, You ought to be working in a way that glorifies God. Every time you spend time in God's word and you go deeper in your faith, it's for the purpose of glorifying God. When you share your faith with someone else, it's so that they can maybe come to know Jesus and glorify God. Everything we do ultimately points to us being able to glorify a God who, by the way, is incredibly worth it. So let's just get that. uh, That's the overall, the purpose of all of this is to glorify God. Now what I want to do is get more specific though. How is God calling, what is God calling us as a church to do to glorify God? How can we, as a Rundle Christian Church, glorify God in our unique calling and our unique vision? If you go on our website and you look up what we believe, you can scroll down to the word church. What do we believe about the church? And our website will tell you that we believe the purpose of the church is to fulfill the last command of Christ. That the reason we exist is to fulfill the last command of Christ. We already know why we do that. It's ultimately for God's glory. But the specific calling of our church is to to do this thing called the Great Commission. One of my favorite things about this verse is that it is the last, these verses I'm about to read, these are the last three verses in the book of Matthew. 
So you have, you know, Jesus is born, and then Jesus grows up, and Jesus uh, begins his adulthood and his ministry, and then Jesus is crucified, and then Jesus comes uh, back to life, and then he's talking to his people, and right before he leaves, he leaves these lasting, these kind of final words, and these are the last three verses in all of the book of Matthew, and here's what they say. It says, Jesus came, and he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So not only do we understand that everything we do as a church is meant to glorify God, right? Not only do we understand that the church's purpose Right, we're going to keep getting a little deeper. The church's purpose is to fulfill this commandment right here. The, the, the Great Commission is what we call this. But we also now see in the Great Commission that there is both a width to the Great Commission, a, a wide, if you will, and there is a deep, a depth to the Great Commission. We see that we are called to go out into all the world. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty wide to me. That's casting a very broad net to go out into all the world. But then it says, to what? To make disciples. That's deep. So if the church is called to go out and cast a wide net and to make disciples, then we are called to be both, listen to this, both wide and deep at the same time. Now you're going to find churches that struggle uh, they, they, they put so much emphasis on one, they're not any good at the other. Some churches are so good at being deep. Man, you go into the church and everything is about pouring into those in the church and kind of giving them exactly what they need and feeding them what they want and everything like this, but you don't see any growth within the church. You don't see anyone outside of the church coming in and feeling like anything is, is for them. And there is no width, but there's a ton of depth. And you'll see other churches that have so much width. Everything is all about people outside the church that when you come into the church there's, and you give your life to Christ, there's no one pouring into you. That's all width and no depth. I believe with all of my heart that God is calling us to be a church that is both deep and wide. And I want to explain, right now you're probably thinking that's not very controversial. Who's going to disagree with that? Wait for it. <laughs> Let me add uh, a little bit of controversy into this thought. The church does not exist. Christian, listen, the church does not exist for you or your preferences. Let me say it again. Once you've given your life to Christ, the church does not exist for you or your preferences. Now that starts to get super controversial. You're probably thinking, I hope Matt talks about this a little bit more. Because to say like the church doesn't exist for me, it doesn't exist for my preferences. There are certain ways I like to do things. There's certain traditions I love in the church. And to say that the church is not about any of those things. Let me show you a passage in scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says this, But you, Christian, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Let's pause right there. What this verse is saying is once you've given your life to Christ, you absolutely, even if you haven't given your life to Christ yet, you are absolutely, no matter what, undoubtedly important and special to God. The Bible says that when you give your life to Christ, you are adopted into his family. You are a princess to a kingly line. You are now royalty. You are a prince. You are, you are chosen. All of these words are like, Matt, according to this verse, I am pretty special. I want to be really clear. You are very special. Whether you are a follower of Christ or you are not a follower of Christ, God loves you so much and wants the best for your life. You are very special. But this verse goes on. All of these things are true. You are chosen. You are royal. You are a holy nation. You are a people for his own possession. That you. In other words, 
So that, here's the reason why. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, what this verse teaches us is the purpose that we exist. The why you are on this planet. You are here so that you can proclaim the excellencies of God. Now, we do that in a couple different ways, right? You can proclaim the excellencies of God to God. We call that worship. We exist so we can proclaim to God, God, you are awesome. I proclaim to you. I sing praises to you. I want you to know how great and awesome you are. That's called worship. But we can also proclaim the excellencies of God to other people. That's width, right? So when I say that the church does not exist for you or your preferences, think about it another way. Remember the two greatest commandments. We are called to love God, proclaim the excellencies of God to God, and to love people, to proclaim the excellencies of God to others. The reason that we gather together as a church, the reason, the purpose that we have as a holy people is not about us. It is about loving God, proclaiming his excellencies to him, and about others, proclaiming his excellencies to others. And so often we take the church and we try to figure out how can I make this church exactly what I want it to be for me. And I understand, listen, there is width and depth at the same time. Our church is called to be both. But think about this for a moment. We see in this passage that the reason there is depth is so that you can be better at being wide. So you can be better at opening your arms wide and worshiping God, and so you can be better at casting a wide net and reaching other people for the gospel. The reason behind depth is so that we can be better at being wide. We're going to be a church that is focused not on you, Christian, and your preferences and your tastes and your likes and dislikes and traditions and all those things, but instead, get this, the moment you, we we call this thing a fishing boat, this church, right? The moment you are on, you've been caught, if you will, the moment you are on the fishing boat, you now become a crew member on the fishing boat. Fishing boats were not designed around the comfort of the fishermen. Fishing boats are designed around the purpose of catching fish. And oftentimes, we, we get ourselves on the fishing boat and we start deciding, I wish this fishing boat was more like this or more like that or more like this for me. Here's, here's where I understand a little bit of that. The reason that we as a fishing boat ought to invest in you, Christian, is so that you can be a better fisherman. So you can be better at glorifying God. It's not for you. No one in this church ought to be focused on on building you up to be a better fisherman so that you can get some sort of a trophy, right? We pour into each other as a body of Christ so that we can love God better and we can love people other. The church does not exist for you or your preferences. Another way I kind of like to think about this is that when you become a follower of Christ— in a way, you need to put on your big boy pants and realize that the purpose of this mission now is no longer specifically about you. The reason you want to continue to pour into your depth, the reason you want to spend time in God's word, the reason you want to be in a life group, the reason you want to go deeper in your faith, all of those things are so that God will get more glory and other people will come to know Jesus. It's not about you. We use this this illustration often about a fishing boat. We call Arundel Christian Church a fishing boat. And let me show you where this comes from. If you have a Bible, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 5? And I'm going to read quite a few verses, so this is a good spot to read along. If you don't own a Bible, grab one in front of you and put your name in it, and you can take that home with you. Luke is in the New Testament, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's a third book of the New Testament. 
We're in chapter 5, and let me, let me read these first 11 verses to you. It says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the Word of God. Now listen, at this point, Jesus didn't have his disciples yet. Jesus was preaching, but he was kind of on his own. And he's out there and he's preaching the word of God. And so many people were kind of gathering around that he was kind of getting pushed back onto, uh, into the water. And eventually he got a little uncomfortable. So he, it says, he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. For the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. So he stepped into one of the boats and he asked Simon, whose name is also Peter. You know, when you read the Bible and you're reading and talking about Peter, Peter goes by three different names. There's uh, Cephas, there's Simon, and there's Peter. All of those are Peter, okay? And, and Peter, Jesus asks him, the owner of the boat, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, now go out where it is deeper and let, your nets, let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in another boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and he said, Oh Lord, please forgive me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, listen to this, from now on, Peter, James, and John, you will be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. As we're still answering this question, what vision has God given us to be unified around? I want to I wanna go explore a little bit deeper in this fishing analogy. If we have been called to fish for people the way that James and John and Peter had been fishing for fish, let's look at this illustration a little bit and explore it for a moment. I want to make a few observations. The first one is this. Notice that they fished at night. This was the next day, right? And it's daylight out, and Simon is off cleaning his nets from being out all night catching nothing. So he is tired. He's had a terrible evening, nothing to show for it. He's ready to go home and go to bed. And, and this is the morning time now. But notice that they fish at nighttime. They, did, they weren't fishing in the daytime. If I were to pull something out of this for us to learn from, it's this. As a church, as a fishing boat model church, we are called to fish in dark places. I, I don't notice many people driving around with their headlights on during the day. You want to know why? Because headlights during the day don't make any sense. We don't shine light into bright places. You don't even notice it. We're called to shine our light into dark places to introduce people to Jesus, people who don't know and don't have any light in their lives. We're called to go into those places and to shine a light and to bring people into the light. We are called to fish in dark places. Here's another observation from this passage. Is that notice that fishing is messy. Have any of you ever been fishing? Anyone deep sea fishing? You notice just, I mean, the, the whole boat smells. It's a bit disgusting, right? You take one little fish and you put a hook through its like eyeballs and put it in the water. I mean, it's just the whole process is a bit gross. There's nothing really clean about it. It's just like you're getting a little whatever. I mean, it's just not a clean thing. Fishing is smelly. It's messy, just like ministry. If God is calling us into dark places, he's calling us into the lives of messy people. And I want to be honest with you, those of you who make up this church, myself included, we are messy people. We have a lot of stuff 
and junk and things that are still disordered in our lives, ministry, part of being a fishing boat model church, is a recognition not only are we called to go into dark places, but we are called into other people's mess. We're not called into the clean and the, the, the prim and the proper. We're called into the messiness of life. There's a verse that I've always found pretty funny in Proverbs 14.4. And here's what it says. It says, Without oxen, a stable stays clean. But you need an, a strong ox for a large harvest. Here's what this verse means. If you're going to put an ox that you need to do ministry, in, to, to harvest, if you're going to put an ox in your stable, you're going to have to shovel some crap. If you take the ox out, man, that thing's going to be nice and clean. There's not going to be a mess in there. It's not going to smell in there. There's not going to be anything to shovel out of there. But you're not going to have the tools that you need for the harvest that is coming. We need to be ready for a harvest. We need to understand that in order to harvest what we're called to harvest, we got to have oxen. we got to have mess. we got to put up with some smelly, gross stuff, right? We are called into that as a church. Very, very important. And I want you to know this too. God is not afraid of your mess. God is not afraid to go into the dark places of your life and to shine light into them. I remember uh, m- maybe 10 years ago, there was this, this student, farther back than that, maybe, I don't know how long it's been, maybe 15 years ago, I met a guy named, named Jim. And Jim was a sixth grader. And a friend invited him onto a retreat, a youth group retreat, where I was the counselor for the sixth grade guys. And Jim had never been to church before. Jim had never been on a youth group trip before. He had never been to a retreat. He had no idea what to expect. And I will tell you this about Jim. He was a total mess. Everything about his life, his family life, the way he made decisions, the language he used, the jokes he told as we were trying to fall asleep, everything about Jim was a disaster. And it was beautiful to watch as the church loved on Jim and embraced his mess and was willing to shine light into dark places to watch Jim, his life changed, and to watch him eventually give his life to Jesus. And now he, he, he works in ministry. I love stories like that. Listen, God is not afraid of your mess. And he calls us as a fishing boat model church into the messy. You know, I'm a, I'll be honest with you about something. I'm a bit messy. My wife, I'm surprised she didn't yell, amen. Um, <laughs> my, my room on my side of the bed tends to get a little messy. My car is always a little bit messy. My desk is a bit messy. My kids, they're a bit messy. Anyone with me on that? You know, I always, I don't mind my mess. I always mind my kids' mess. You know, at night when you step on your kids' mess, that's when you get frustrated. But I know one day, right, my kids uh, won't be in the home to leave a mess anymore, and I'll miss it. A mess is, an ev- is evidence a lot of times of, of life, of things happening, of, of priorities being in the right order. Now, I'm not saying that if you're just a total mess, you got everything figured out, and those who are clean don't. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying we need to be willing to embrace the mess. It's part of what it means to be fishers of men. Here's another observation. That fishing is our purpose. Notice that when uh, Jesus calls Peter, and he says, hey, I, I, I want you to now no longer fish. I, I know that this is your, your, the way you make a living. I know that you own these boats. I know you own these nets. I know this is your business and how you provide. I know that this is what you know and what you're good at. But I want you to leave all of that behind, and I want you to follow me. I want you to do things my way. And one of the craziest things that he says is he looks at Peter and he says, don't be afraid. 
I want, I'm going to call you into something uncomfortable. I'm going to call you into something difficult. But I want you to follow me, and I want you to not be afraid to do it. And then it's just amazing that Peter recognizes that the purpose of his life in that moment was changed. He was no longer fishing for fish. He was now destined to fish for men, and he followed Jesus without fear. Now, I, I, maybe there was fear, but I know that he, he left his nets there, he left his boats there, he left his livelihood there on that shore, and he followed Jesus. There's something powerful about this truth that we need to be a church that's willing to listen to oh God, or sorry, listen to God and obey even when it's difficult. Whatever God is calling us to, we need to be willing to listen and to obey even if it's difficult. One of the best examples right now that we're in the middle of is, you know, our finances are tight. You know that we're behind budget for this year. And yet God called our leadership team into something radical called this generous initiative where we're going to take an entire week's offering and commit it to generous initiatives in our community, to loving the least of these, to helping out people who need some help. We're going to take money that we desperately need to, to, to pay a mortgage and, and payroll and other things like that. And instead, we're going to trust, even though it doesn't make any sense, that God is going to, as long as he's asked us to do it, which we believe he has, we're going to be faithful to obey. We're going to trust him, even if it's difficult. And then we're going to watch as the nets overflow and break. Are you guys ready to watch what God's going to do as we're a church that trusts and obeys even when it's difficult? Here's the, if that's the what, you know, if God is calling us, let me, let me put this, this idea up on the screen. As long as there are lost people, our main goal will always be to reach lost people for God's glory. In other words, listen, we're going to be a church that has width and depth, but the reason we have depth is so we can be better at width and praising God. Our main goal will always be to reach lost people for God's glory. Here's the how. We've got to answer this next uh, question. How does God want us to accomplish this vision? This one I find also to be a bit controversial. In fact, this is probably the most controversial answer I'm going to share. And I get to, to not have to worry about it being controversial because instead of telling you what I think, I'm just going to read the scripture. I'm going to read verses for you out of God's word and show you what Paul says here to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23, it says this. Even though I am a free man with no master, remember this is Paul speaking to the church in Corinth, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did so so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share in their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. This verse right here answers the question, how are we called to reach the lost world for Christ? And I think what the verse says is, Hey, Arundel Christian Church, I want you to do whatever you got to do as long as you're obeying the law of Christ. As long as whatever you're doing is within the confines of Scripture, as long as we never abandon this book as a church, whatever it takes to introduce someone to Jesus, do it. 
He says, listen, when I'm with the Jewish people, I do Jewish things so I can win Jewish people to, uh, to Christ. And when I'm with the Gentiles, I, I, I behave and act like a Gentile so that I can win the Gentiles to Christ. When I'm with people who are weak, I, I, I act weak so I can win them in their weakness to Christ. Paul is saying, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for the cause of the gospel. And I want you to understand something really unique about Anne Arundel County. This community that we've been called to is not really unchurched. I would say that we're more de-churched. Most people in this community have an association with a church at some point in their lives. Uh, maybe not a Christian church, whatever background it might be, but my point is everybody has an experience for the most part in church. And they understand church's traditions, they understand these different things and preferences and the way churches do things. They have all of this, or they think they have an understanding of the way the church looks and feels and acts. And they, they read the news and they hear about all these bad things happening within the church and they want nothing to do with the church because of those. Listen, we live in a community that doesn't really much care for the church. So I put this statement together. Here's where we're going to maybe be a bit controversial this is my paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 9. It says, When in Andrano County, where many people have rejected religious tradition, we too are going to be a church that rejects religious or avoids religious tradition. We obey the word of God, but not the man-made traditions and preferences of the church and those in the church, doing whatever we can to save some. Now, this might be really uncomfortable for you. You might think, Matt, I have some things that I just really like about church. I have certain ways I like to sing my songs, and I have certain things that I like to make sure are said, and I prefer when, you know, there's a, a, a closing prayer, and I prefer this, and I prefer that, and I have these things that I've always grown to love, and these are these traditions that I can't find anywhere in God's Word, but it's just the preferences I have and the way we ought to do things. And what I want to submit to you is that if we're going to be a church committed to the Great Commission, we need to remind ourselves that the church does not exist for us or to meet our preferences. The reason we come and the reason we invest in our own lives in the depth is so that we can be better at reaching the lost. The things we do, the decisions we make, the direction we're moving ought to be focused on people outside of the church meeting Jesus. And recognizing that the church isn't what they thought it was. The church wasn't necessarily all of those bad things and the traditions and the, the preferences that they have grown to hate. We need to be willing to, to move outside of those preferences to win some to Jesus. Here's a, a third question. Who does God want to accomplish this vision? I don't know if this one's quite so controversial, but let me, let me explain this. Oftentimes when people say, who is God calling to fulfill the purposes and the vision of this church? It's easy for each of us to say, well, you know, Pastor Matt and Pastor Chris, and Pastor Dustin and, and, and Jen and, and Mitch and all these people, like we, 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 we put our ties in and, and they take a salary and so they, they, we pay them to go out and do the work of the church. And I bring people to church and then Matt shares the gospel. Matt does the work. Matt, Matt just, no, listen, here's, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that is completely opposite of the way things ought to look. Who is God calling to accomplish this vision? In Ephesians 4, it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. So God is, or, or, or Paul is saying to the Ephesian people that God has given to the church your pastors. Your pastors are a gift to you from God. And then it says their responsibility. In other words, my responsibility as a pastor here at ACC is to equip you to do the work. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Listen, 
you have just as much ability to share the good news of the gospel with people around you. You have just as much ability to visit someone in the hospital. You have just as much ability to teach and to love people and to cook a meal for someone. You have just as much of all that as as anyone on staff does. And our job is to equip you, to give you what you need, to train you up, to give you the depth that you need so that you're better and more equipped and more effective at going wide, at sharing the gospel with a lost world. So who does God want to accomplish this vision? Don't keep looking at me. Us. God's calling each and every one of you to this mission. And the last question, I don't think this will be controversial by any means. When is God calling us to act on this vision? Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 answers uh, nicely. It says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So in other words, once you understand what the Lord is calling you to do, once you have a mission and a vision in front of you, you need to make the most of every opportunity. When is God calling us to this vision as a church? Now. God is calling us to be unified around this God-given vision now, to be a church committed to seeing the lost come to Christ now, to be a church willing to do whatever it takes to see that happen within the confines of Scripture now, to be a, a church dedicated to doing the work ourselves now. So like, like most every Sunday, we always finish with this thought, what now, God? God, what do I do with this information? What do I do now that I have the why and I have the what and I have the how and I have the who and I have the when? What can I do? And what I want to do is I want to put all of this together into one phrase. And I want you to ponder this phrase with me. I want you to think about whether or not you can be unified with me around this thought as a church. In other words, this is our bullseye. When we look through the scope and we see a bullseye on the other end, this is what I'm suggesting to you right now is the God-given target that he has laid out for Arundel Christian Church. The first part of it is this. This is our what. God wants us to fervently seek the lost while simultaneously working to transform followers of Christ into fully engaged disciples who fervently seek the lost. God is wanting us to be so committed to reaching the lost that we do so and then we are also committed into depth within our own lives so that we can be more effective at doing the first thing over again and so that other people will be more effective at doing those things over again. And remember that this whole circle is all so that God gets the glory. That's the what we're called to do. And then we get to the how. I'm going to add to the phrase, and whatever it takes to do that, while honoring the words of Christ. Whatever words we need to start using or stop using, whatever truth we need to highlight in in God's word, and whatever color we need to paint walls, whatever songs we need to sing on stage, whatever it's going to take to do that within the laws of Christ and then then we get to the who we are committed to making that happen I'm going to add the two more words on the end the win with urgency so let me read that for us and I'm going to pray I believe that God is calling Arundel Christian Church uniquely to this bullseye right here God wants us to fervently seek the lost while simultaneously working to transform followers of Christ into fully engaged disciples who fervently seek the lost. And whatever it takes to do that, while honoring the words of Christ, we are committed to making that happen with urgency. If you can stand on that with me, if you believe that, if you want to be on that fishing boat, if you understand the the boat and where we're headed and you're saying, I'm on board, I want to be a part of that. I want to encourage you, especially if you're an attender at ACC, 
If you've never taken that step towards partnership, I want to encourage you to, to take that next step, to become a partner at ACC, to, to commit to this vision, to be unified around this vision by partnering with us. And maybe you've never given your life to Christ and you need to make that decision today. Maybe during this last song, you need to spend some time and maybe come up here. I'll stand over here by this table and you just need to tell me, Matt, I, I want to get on the fishing boat. I don't want to... I don't want to be in the water anymore. I want to live my life on purpose, the purpose that God has given for me to live it. I want to give my life to Jesus. Come tell me that. I'd l- love to pray with you and to talk to you. Let's pray together now. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for a chance to talk through why change is something that you've ordained for your church. That you call your church to constantly be, be progressing and that we can't make progress without change. God, help us to be a church that embraces what you're doing, that sees the bigger purpose of reaching people, lost people for the cause of the gospel, and to be willing to set aside our own preferences, our own desires for that sake. To recognize that we're on this fishing boat for the sole purpose of of catching fish for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, Please remember, you belong at ACC.